wenn man wie ich im 85. Lebensjahr steht. I is equal m c square. Since the dawn of human evolution, our productivity has always been limited by the availability of daylight. Be it hunting animals or agriculture, leaving us rest of the day doing nothing, which limited the economic output. The productivity of today's modern world can be simply attributed to this idea and how it led a pathway to numerous important scientific innovation. This is how Lightbulb invented quantum physics. During the medieval period, our option to illuminate our surrounding in night was limited to few options like candle, oil lamp and whale oil lamps. But as the industrial revolution kicked in Europe, various new alternative sources of energy came into existence. We got the insight to separate the crude oil in its various components such as kerosene. However, for city-scale illumination, one of the candidates that hold its ground was coal gas. Now, when you heat up coal in absence of air at extreme temperature, it emits a mixture of hydrogen, methane and carbon monoxide, which is indeed flammable and can be later distributed through the network of pipes. This idea was first demonstrated by William Murdoch in 1792 to illuminate his own house using coal gas. But it took another 15 years to find its commercial application when Frederick Windsor installed a gas-powered street lamp in Pall Mall, London on 1807. This artwork tries to depict people's reaction towards this newly powered gas lighting which they have never seen before. And the network of gas pipelines started to expand to cities like Paris and Berlin. Many people started to shift towards the solution for heating their homes. Also, gas-powered street lamps started becoming ubiquitous. Early, they used to be lit manually and later, mechanical devices were added to automate this process to a certain extent. Even today, in some parts of UK and Germany, you can see them in action, despite LED is more efficient as people still like the sentimental aspect of gas lamp. As this network expanded to more households, regulations from local authorities and government were enacted to ensure there is a consistent steady supply of gas so that all the street lamps illuminate properly. But here's where a real journey would start. The question is, how do you objectively measure the intensity of light? Usually, more light means more fire. And you might think about using a photon diode to measure the current so that you can objectively trace its like what is the peak output of the radiation. But remember, we are talking about things that were before 1900. And the best instrument that they had was human eye. Now, some of you might freak out and predict where am I going with this, but realistically, they were just getting started and I guess everyone has to start from somewhere. Take for example observing the brightness of star with a normal telescope. Seems non-trivial, right? But in our case, the intensity of gas-powered lamp was firstly compared to the length and width of flames of candle. And in Britain, Germany and France had their own standards, whether the gas lamp is two or three times brighter than that of a candle. And hence, we got the name candela, which we still use today as a unit to measure light's intensity. Now everyone at the time knew there was an urgent need to solve this problem as their money was on the line. So we had to develop a new branch of physics in optics that is photometry, spectroscopy and others. What we just saw was an example of visual photometry meaning use of eye which is obviously susceptible to human bias and slowly we had to transition to instrument-led photometry. Parallelly from the start of 1800, there was also a great emphasis on discovering the nature of electricity. All these physicists contributed greatly in developing our current understanding of electricity. Humphrey Davy was the first person who developed an arc lamp. And within the next few decades, there was a great focus on the R&D of improving light bulb. Various designs were experimented in the shape of outer glass, the composition of filament and even the bulb holder. Various types of materials were used as electrodes like carbon, cotton, magnesia, paper and even bamboo. Yes, Edison did made a bamboo filament light bulb. Even the carbon electrode itself had hundreds of versions and until over the period in mid-1900, everyone settled on tungsten filament as it was brittle and figuring out manufacturing tungsten wire at massive scale was a huge challenge. Coming back to mid-1800, there was an intense competition between Europe and US electrical companies to dominate the market. On one hand, we had Edison and Westinghouse in US and we had Siemens and AEG on the European side. 
there was a great amount of physics that went into making a better light bulb be it resistivity thermodynamics radiation studies etc you name it one of the example that i found interesting was of walter nust by profession a chemist and also the inventor of third law of thermodynamics created a nust lamp which didn't require a vacuum and could burn in open air without getting oxidized quite a unique design in my perspective AEG promoted his bulb and later he sold his patent to Westinghouse for US market for his contribution in chemistry he was awarded a Nobel prize in case if you want to learn more about him you can visit this site nurst.de which had all of his significant details similar was the case for Irving Langmuir when JP Morgan merged Edison's General Electric with Thomson Houston company and created a lamp which had coiled tungsten wire which prolonged the life of incandescent lamp As for Siemens after expanding their business into multiple electric sector Werner von Siemens recognized the importance of establishing a national institution to promote scientific research and metallurgy in Germany in collaboration with other scientists and engineer he funded PTR in 1887 now i'm not a german so here's a tta sound bite of it physicalish technische rack sandstalt moving on The critical task of PTR was standardization of kilowatt hour, ohm, luminosity, spectroscopy, photometry, cryogenics and many more. The advantage of funding PTR was German companies could offload the R&D to this institution and directly access the latest innovation at that time. And as luck would have it, Max Planck, William Wien and even Einstein would go on to work in PTR. Before coming to Planck, we had to talk in brief about thermodynamics. At the beginning of industrial revolution we started to harness the power of heat to power steam turbine locomotive etc and folks like C.D. Carnot Gauss Clausius and other laid the foundation of understanding of how heat works and how to make efficient system but all of them focused more or less on macroscopic scenario and didn't quite knew what was going on on the molecular level This is when Ludwig Boltzmann came up with a probabilistic study of statistical mechanics to help us understand how molecules in gas and solid particles were behaving. So, after knowing quite a bit about thermodynamics, there was also an interest to apply these laws on thermal radiation. Gustav Robert Kirchhoff was first to come up with law of thermal emission that if any material at stable surrounding temperature and if it absorbs any thermal radiation then it should also emit same amount of energy otherwise the material will keep getting heavier and accumulate infinite energy which clearly doesn't happen according to the law of conservation of energy even though kirchhoff proposed this law he didn't really tell what was the relation of energy distribution of thermal radiation with respect to its temperature but kirchhoff did introduce a concept of black body wherein an ideal material is capable of absorbing any incident radiation A black body doesn't necessarily have to be black. In real life nothing fully absorbs 100% radiation. But the closest example that we have is of sun. Yes, it seems ironic but sun is near perfectly capable of absorbing all the electromagnetic radiation that falls on it. As for man-made materials, we have charcoal and venta black which is used by BMW to showcase in 2019 Frankfurt Motor Show as Venta Black X6. Kirchhoff published his result on emissivity in 1860 but it took 1893 for William Wien to improvise on work of Kirchhoff as constructing a lab perfect black body was a challenging task. William Wien in his paper on the energy distribution in the emission spectrum of a black body proposed a spectroscopic diagram telling what's the relation between spectral energy density and wavelength. Hey, sorry for breaking your flow. There's some mistake which I just spot during my editing process and just wanted to highlight that. Uh remember the year which I talked about 1893 for William Bean that's actually 1896 the correct chronologies are as follows in 1893 he published his formula about displacement law which something looks like this and then in 1895 he and Otto Lehmer made a cavity radiator at PTR and then in 1896 he published his paper about black body radiation which we just saw previously in this spectrographic diagram And then in 1899 Otto Lehmer and Ernest Pringsham if I'm pronouncing his name correctly tried to just verify his result in actual real life and they found out some deviation at longer wavelength. So just wanted to highlight it that uh yeah and sorry for my mistake I'll just be cautious next time. Uh with that said just continue watching the video. To really understand what this chart says let's again talk on our light bulb. 
we already know that the LED lights are way more efficient than tungsten filament lamp. So the question is, can we make incandescent light bulb glow brighter than an LED at same power consumption? Now this chart shows a spectral energy distribution of incandescent light bulb and only a small portion of it lies in visible spectrum and rest other is purely in form of infrared or heat. And as you can see, my body is radiating quite a lot of infrared, even though at normal temperature, you cannot see anything. Now, you compare it with LED, you will find that most of its energy distribution lie in visible spectrum. That is why a 10 watt LED gives equal or more brightness than a 60 watt incandescent lamp. And technically, a incandescent lamp is more of a heater than a light bulb itself. And if you have ever used incandescent lamp, you know it's not safe to touch the outer glass as the temperature can anywhere between 150 to 200 degrees Celsius. Now coming to Wien, after Wien proposed his paper in just two years in 1895, Otto Lummer and Wien developed a cavity radiator at PTR to test his theory in real life. What they found out was the paper gave accurate result except at higher wavelength. Now, Wien wasn't the only one who tried to solve this problem. Lord Rayleigh and James Jean proposed a Rayleigh Jean's law which satisfied the condition at longer wavelength, but it failed terribly at shorter wavelength giving ultraviolet radiation. To understand it well, let's again take an example of heating and metal. We already know that when it gets hotter and hotter, it changes its color from dull red to bright yellow. Assuming hypothetically that the melting point of this metal is very high and it won't melt. In this case, this theory said that eventually it will change its color to ultraviolet. In that case, it will be invisible to our eyes. So, when was the last time you saw any object getting invisible just by heating it? It just doesn't work like that. So then, why weren't they able to solve this problem? Well, the answer is Newton or I should say the classical physics. Now assume an apple is falling off of a tall building. In this case, at each time frame, you can measure its potential energy by the formula mgh, where m is the mass of the object, g is the gravity, and h is the height above the ground level. And since the height of apple is decreasing, the potential energy will also come to zero when it lands on the ground. In this case, what we saw was that potential energy was continuously decreasing, which translated to increasing kinetic energy. Similarly, for all the scenario, classical physics assumed that the energy flowed in continuous manner. Max Planck troubled with this problem for many years since Kirchhoff proposed his idea and thought about what if the energy was not continuous and rather followed a pattern of discrete energy level or quanta. Planck himself knew quite a bit about Boltzmann statistical mechanics and its distribution curve. What it essentially says that the energy of particle can lie anywhere on this curve. But the actual way to look at it, it comprises of many small staircases where an electron could jump one by one. Planck came up with Planck's constant which is 6.62607015 into 10 to the power minus 34 joules second. Planck's constant is like a universal ruler which measures the height of those energy steps. And just because this quantity is so small, it barely makes any difference at macroscopic level. And that kind of explains that why no one really took notice of it for a very long time. While growing up, Planck himself was quite skeptical of dealing with probability. He was a man of determinism, meaning before you throw a dice, if you could tell all of his initial condition, you could tell exactly what will be the value of dice facing up. But what if you have 100 or even thousands of dice? In that case, you have to use probability. Similar was the case for molecules as they are in huge volumes. Eventually, Planck found comfort in accepting things probabilistically and he did publish his paper on the law of distribution of energy in normal spectrum. Yeah, I know it sounds quite a bit jargon but finally it solved the black body problem and practical tests confirmed his validity and matched the predicted values. Even though he solved this black body problem, he didn't really understand the magnitude of his work until Einstein came up with his photoelectric theory that when an electromagnetic radiation hits an electron, the electron jumps to the next higher level and when it comes back to normal level, it emits a photon back to its surrounding and thus we see electromagnetic waves aka light. So there you go. This is how light bulb invented quantum physics. Trust me, there's a lot more interesting stuff that I haven't covered and I have just barely scratched the surface. 
So I highly recommend you to go through all the reference material that I have linked in the description. The inspiration for this video was really derived from the book called Quantum by Manjit Kumar, where he mentions one line and I quote, The need to make a better light bulb was a driving force behind PTR black body research program in 1890s. It would lead to an accident discovery of quanta, as Planck turned out to be a right man in the right place at the right time. But he didn't mention how it was, as no physics textbook talk about this thing. So I took it upon myself to just kind of deep go deep in it. And finally, after doing research for many months, this video took its shape and form. And one thing that I really noticed is that the physics textbook don't do a great justice in describing the historical aspect of it. It's always like, you know, this theory was flawed, this theory was repeated by, I mean, corrected by XYZ, you know, making it much more dry, which really scares away millions of students away from the physics. Rather, the details and the historical facts are really beautiful and really attractive. But I don't know why it's, it's not covered in textbooks and all of that. And, you know, one thing that I really noticed is that as great as these physicists were, we should not forget the logistics part that go behind this process to make all this scientific innovation happen. In our case, it was Werner von Siemens who made all this, you know, scientific uh, innovation possible at much greater pace. And looking at the PTR kind of thing really made me realize that there was like cohesive, you know, connected working where the, where the industrial demands and the institute were working very closely to solve a problem. And in today's academia where the research is asking something else and the academia is delivering something else, the gap between both of them is just increasing day by day. And we have no solution for that. And the looking at the PTR example kind of gives us a reference about how the industry and academia relations should really work together. And the application of this research still goes on to influence our life even today, be it the laser and fiber optic network which we used to really communicate with all other peoples globally, be it the high resolution detailed galaxy images from JWST, satellite communications and even 5G as per se. There's a lot more things that have been really evolved out of this research. And as like an assignment, I wanted to kind of go through this stack exchange answer where it's been debated that whether Planck was really commissioned by these light bulb companies to really work on this black body problem. So that's all what I wanted to tell in this video. So yeah, if you have any questions, comments or suggestions, just leave down in the comment box below. I'll be happy to get back to you. You can also email us at this address. So yeah, uh, with that said, I thank you for watching this video. Goodbye.